Academy of Art University's Urban Nights Update is next. Coming up, a whole new career and revenue stream centering around people who follow you on social media. An inside look at why coffee is now a social companion among young people. We'll examine the Hollywood phenomenon of whitewashing, where acting roles are given to Caucasian actors no matter what the roles call for. And a movie that is for sure to, gonna bring up some awkward teenage memories. All that and more next on Urban Nights Update. Hello and welcome to Academy of Art University's Urban Nights Update. Thank you for joining us. With me is Jackson Alpert and I'm Mackenzie Granville. President-elect Donald Trump is in the process of selecting his cabinet members, and so far the tra transition has been anything but smooth. The discord started with the sudden resignation of Mike Rogers, who had handled matters of national security. Disagreements over key cabinet appointments have contributed to the shift being described as a knife fight. Trump has named traditional Republican Reince Priebus his chief of staff, alongside the alt-right leader of Breitbart News, Steve Bannon, who will act as his chief strategist. Although some decisions have been made, senior White House officials say that all efforts have been frozen since Vice President-elect Mike Pence, who has taken charge of the transition, hasn't signed the legally required paperwork to allow the collaboration with Obama's aides. This controversial election has led to protests, riots, and now a new bill to end the Electoral College. This proposal is being introduced by retiring Democratic Senator Barbara Boxer, who was a very outspoken Clinton supporter throughout the 2016 election. She says Trump's victory was solely due to him winning the Electoral College, even though Clinton won the popular vote. She went on by stating her reason for this proposal is that the Electoral College is an outdated system that does not reflect modern society. Since the election, there seems to be no end to the anti-Trump protests all throughout the U.S. Protests began in Oakland the following day, and over the weekend, protesters joined hands around the three and a half miles around Lake Merritt to show their opposition. And Oakland isn't the only place dealing with this issue. People in New York, San Francisco, D.C., Philadelphia, and Chicago are up in arms. Many of the protest protesters are concerned that Trump will carry out his 100-day plan, which consists of removing environmental regulations, deporting undocumented immigrants, and closing the U.S. borders to, re to refugees. Larger-scale protests are being planned very publicly. Big names like Academy Award winner Michael Moore are urging people to participate in various forms of protest. Hundreds of thousands plan on participating in a march on Washington the day after the presidential-elect Donald Trump is inaugurated. With all of these protests and controversy, Jade Evans went out this week and to see what kind of reaction people had to news of Donald Trump's election. Thank you very much, everybody. With Donald Trump Sorry becoming our new president, it sparked a lot of controversy. So I went on the streets to find out what people were thinking about him winning against Hillary Clinton. I was shocked initially. Um, I'm not surprised a Republican is was elected, considering we had a Democrat in office for so long. I was shocked that it was specifically Donald Trump and not, say, like Ted Cruz. Um, mostly because he's he doesn't know how the government works, for one. Two, he's completely vulgar to every person except white straight males. So I was just surprised that majority of the company in the country um, elected him and I can't really find a reason why we would have elected him and sure Hillary was not the greatest candidate neither of them were great but it was obvious that one was better than the other honestly I was in shock I was really in disbelief how did we let this guy, with what type of experience, what is his history, become our president? I'm, I was sad, and I'm just scared. Facebook and Google are being blamed by half of the nation for the election of Donald Trump. The argument stems from the fact that Facebook and Google play a massive role in the distribution of information, whether it be correct or incorrect. A majority of users do not go to direct sources to read this information, 
thus making it very easy for false information to go viral. President Obama called Facebook a dust cloud of nonsense when asked about the spreading of false information. Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg responded to the ac accusations by stating that the majority of information being shared on the platform is true. Major social media site Twitter announced that it is cracking down on hate and harassment in the wake of the election. The company will begin by muting conversations containing keywords targeting others based on race, gender, ethnicity, and other factors. The social media platform states that it doesn't expect this to remove hate completely, but it hopes it will stop the spread of negative content, something Facebook has yet to address. While some spreading of information via social media platforms is unintentional, we have Noah Daniels with a story on how millennials and companies are teaming up to influence the masses. Everyone wants a job that they love, but for a lot of people, finding something that allows them to pursue their passion and make money is nearly impossible. Many millennials, however, are making careers out of what they love to do, creating content and posting on social media platforms like Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. YouTube personality Lindsay Ashton is one of the millennials lucky enough to be a media influencer, a new job title given to those content creators who make a living doing what they love. I make fashion and lifestyle videos and sometimes makeup videos um, and it's just like for fun and just to like bond with like the viewers I guess and like for Instagram I collaborate with photographers and like they take pictures of me and it's just like it's just fun. The primary job of a media influencer is to promote and market both themselves and products to specific demographics. Companies seek media influencers out to reach people traditional marketing strategies are now failing to target. Now, middleman companies like H Influencers Collective are working with influencers to connect the right person with the right company. Adi Chabra, an employee for Google, says that this form of marketing is ever-growing. Oh, there's tons of ways that companies use media influencers. It's uh, really important at Google. Obviously, YouTube is part of Google and so video is a big part of our strategy uh, and so things that we do is we will go and find the most people uh, most popular people on YouTube and pay them uh, to influence kind of what the market is seeing what different trends are um, and then you can see this kind of through different industries like M&E movies music all that fun stuff <laughs> Media influencers can make thousands of dollars a day doing sponsored posts and videos, but according to Lindsay, being a media influencer isn't about making money. Hopefully positive, like somebody that has a positive impact on like people's lives and like inspires people to do things or like inspires them to like be a better person or like live the life they want. In San Francisco, I'm Noah Daniels with the Academy of Arts Urban Nights Update. To find out more about media influencers, go to hinfluencers.com. Today's teenagers may live somewhat of a sheltered life, and in doing so, they see many different media outlets. Parents may be thinking that the media has bad influences on their children, but are they right? A website called Mom Junction has said the media helps develop social skills. It could inspire them or help develop reading and writing skills. You could even fine-tune your motor skills. So before you pull the plug, you might want to check out just how the media influences the young. The short rental company Airbnb has been fighting the city of San Francisco for its short rental rights since June. According to a U.S. district judge, San Francisco does not have a proper functional verification system, which means the city cannot push for a new law until it defines what the rules are. The vacation rental law would regulate the duration and to whom the company could rent to. Meanwhile, Airbnb is arguing that this is against its First Amendment rights. Due to the mix and confusion between passengers and drivers, the company Lyft is now making it easier for passengers to find their drivers. As we know, Lyft was known by its big furry mustaches in front of its cars as well as its glow stash, but now Lyft is creating a device on its app called the AMP, which is a bit similar to the old glow stash. The only change is that this time it has its logo and the colors change, according to your ride. For example, if you get a green light on the amp, Lyft will notify through their app. So now you will know your, to how to track your driver. Just as modes of housing and transportation have changed, so has coffee. Nowadays, millennials do not see coffee as just a caffeine fix, but as a girlfriend. Michaela Sterner explains what that's all about. Drinking coffee was usually a ritual you did at home. However, the millennials have changed the trend. 
What defines a coffee you drink is often depending on the coffee's brand and what the brand stands for in different kinds of issues, like the environment. However, the barista Evan Berger does not think there is a bigger change about the coffee industry. I think the younger people probably are paying more attention to where their coffee is coming from. Um, and in general, their tastes may be a little bit more discerning. I think they're still pretty open-minded. It really depends where you're talking about, but I think older people are a lot more flexible with the taste. It is not only the trend that have changed within the coffee industry. According to Data Essential, a Chicago-based researcher, 19 to 34-year-olds stands for 44% of the coffee consumers in the US. One factor, they say, is because people start to drink coffee during a younger age. People are demanding quality, which has led to the popularity of gourmet coffee. The difference between gourmet beans and regular beans is that regular is often treated. Meanwhile, gourmet is plucked every 10th year. Josephine Heinz Wachtere is a daily coffee drinker, and she says that for her, it is a matter of the quality. I actually think more of um, the taste of the coffee and the quality rather than uh, out of uh, environmental kind of state of mind. Although Josephine mostly think about the quality of the coffee, she still believes that the coffee has become a fashion statement. I would rather go around with, you know, like a good looking cup of coffee rather than like Starbucks, for example, so yeah. In San Francisco, I'm Michaela Stanner for Urban Nights Update. Although the coffee consumption is getting higher, it will soon become more expensive due to the drought in Brazil. Experts say there's still a chance that the coffee industry could still recover there. Some people may think that coffee and tea aren't very good for the human body. A long time study at Harvard University has finished recently. The conclusion? That consistent coffee drinkers may have a much lower risk of type 2 diabetes because of their habit. The numbers are staggering. Now this isn't saying that non-coffee drinkers are at a high risk, but of the coffee and tea community, the more you drink, the lower your risk might be. With everything going on in the political world today, Vanessa Arslay covered an event that all Americans can appreciate. This last weekend on Sunday was the 96th annual Veterans Day Parade. The parade celebrates our veterans and the sacrifices that they and their families have made throughout the years to protect our freedom. Navy veteran George Ishikara spoke of the importance of the holiday. I think Veterans Day is very special and it means a lot to veterans that have served their country and made a commitment to uphold and defend the Constitution. I think it means as much to the families as it does to the veterans because the families sacrifice a lot when a service member, a soldier, or a sailor, or airman, marine, you know, gives their time and does their duty. Some of the attendees, like Steve Dolgin and Annette Traverso, remember times when veterans were not appreciated for their sacrifices. And they point out how nice it is to see that culture change. I joined the military starting with college ROTC during the Vietnam era when the, when the military personnel were spit on, they were called baby killers and all this sort of thing. The veterans were not respected at all. That has totally changed now and I think it means a lot to all veterans of all eras, but as particularly our Vietnam veterans. They're finally getting the recognition they deserve after all of these years. Memorial Chapter 464, Vietnam Veterans of America. Let's give them a big round of applause. Today's Veterans Day. My brother actually didn't make it back from Vietnam, but he was awarded a Silver Star. The Marines, the rest of his buddies that came home, they were treated um, very badly. Um, they had, they were spit at, and people called them names and because they didn't agree with the Vietnam War. Now today with this parade down here, it seemed that the tides have changed and that people are now realizing that our veterans have done, did something for them, and that was to protect them and give us this freedom that is not free. To find more ways to help out our veterans, visit vetfriends.com. In San Francisco, I'm Vanessa Arcele for Urban Nights Update. Now let's go to Noah Daniels for your sports news. 
Hello and welcome to the Academy of Arts Sports. We have a lot to talk about, so let's jump right in. Men's basketball started off its season with two back-to-back -back games last Friday and Saturday night. Off to a bit of a rough start, the boys lost 84-69 to Friday night to San Francisco State. Forward Chris Salas scored his career high with 22 points against the Gators, but it wasn't quite enough to pull the win. Last season, Salas averaged 11 points per game with a total of 275 points in the 2015 season. Following closely behind him, guard Ukena Okaneme averaged 7 points in the 2015 season. Saturday night, the Urban Knights won against the Stan Stelina State University Warriors 88-85. Freshman Dante Williams sealed the win with free throws late in the extra period of the game. When asked about how they played, he said he felt like when things started going downhill, they pulled together as a team. With new, nine new players, this season of men's basketball is ex expected to be successful. Already scoring a total of 157 points at the beginning of the season, their next game is tonight at 5.30 in Ronert Park against Cal State Bernardino. Good luck. While a lot of the artist athletes here at the Academy have accomplished amazing things, the Academy of Art Track and Field's own Mobilade Ajamale might have them beat with a bronze medal from the 2016 Rio Olympics. Ajamali sat down with us in a first ever interview about his experience at the games. Let's take a look. At the Olympics, I was just kind of like, all right, just take it in, you know, enjoy it, enjoy yourself, and go out there, have fun. So I was actually looking for my parents and like, just kind of looking around the crowd, taking it all in. Um, and then once the gun went, you know, just did what we've been practicing for the last, I don't know how long we've been practicing the relay. And uh, once Brendan was coming into me, I saw him reacted and just went, and uh, I felt that was probably the fastest I'd felt running. I mean, it was so easy for me to, to run that last leg, and it just felt so efficient to me, and I was, I was happy and proud of how I did. Track and field has its first match January 13th, but until then, the team will continue to practice for a great season. Women's volleyball is coming to an end, and last week, they celebrated their seniors, Melissa Brum and Cabrina Spickman. At the senior game, the girls won 3-0 over the University of Hawaii's Hilo's Volcans. The RE women have their last match of the season against Holy Names tomorrow at 3 p.m. But before her last game, we have Melissa Brum with one of her season highlights. I had been counting originally how many kills and points, I, well, mostly just kills that I needed. I didn't really realize I could have the points record. But um, I just remember getting my first kill and looking at KB, and that was pretty special because, you know, she's been with me through the whole four years, and I could hear my parents cheering. And then the next time I got the kills record, I could hear my parents going crazy and KB was just smiling and that was pretty awesome. Congratulations to Melissa and Cabrina on your careers with the Urban Knights. That's all we have until next time. Back to you. Hollywood is walking on glass. Films here in America have a truly significant global culture impact on what, why, and how people think the way we do. Sadly, Hollywood seems to be only playing one tune, that of being white and being male. Recently, a new infographic has surfaced based on worldwide box office numbers from Box Office Mojo. In it, they analyzed the top 500 films of all time, and what they found was truly shocking. Only six starred a woman of color. That's 1% of the top 500 films. A startling stat that poses serious implications regarding how people of color and women are valued in society. That means it's been over 20 years since Hollywood really put its monetary muscle behind a film centered on a living, breathing woman of color. Whitewashing is a serious crime, and Hollywood has been doing it for years. For those of you who don't know what whitewashing is, it is when an actor or actress, white in skin color, portrays a character that is of another ethnicity. Not until just recently, though, has it become a real issue. I have more on the story. Hollywood, usually a place for people to achieve their dreams and become famous, is now being known for whitewashing critically acclaimed movies. From movies like Pan all the way to The Last Airbender, it has been causing much controversy over the past few years. Hollywood has been producing a lot of whitewashed movies over the years, but one in particular has been causing a lot of controversy. It's called Ghost in the Shell, where Scarlett Johansson plays the main character. I got to interview Rex Armstrong about how he feels about this. They were relatively powerless about it, 
So like for breakfast at Tiffany's when they had a white guy play an Asian guy, it was frowned upon, but no one was really like up in arms about it. But since times have changed, people feel that Hollywood is more accepting and there's more black people getting black roles, Asians getting Asian roles. But I think Hollywood thinks they can sneak whitewashing past us and we're but we're not gay, we're not like blind about it anymore. Like um, Scarlett Johansson got cast for Ghost in the Shell, an anime movie where the main character is Japanese and when people were up in arms about it they said uh, oh, we're gonna CGI her eyes to make her look more Asian. When people are like, why not just cast an Asian woman? But what if the main issue isn't the actors, but the directors themselves? It hurts on like a personal level because growing up, I would always watch like movies where people are supposed to be Latino or Filipino, and it would personally hurt because. I would think that's what I'm supposed to look like or that's how I'm supposed to be portrayed for and for the longest time it just hurt because I didn't think that was me. I wasn't me. So it just hurts. Hopefully Hollywood can learn from its mistakes so we can have a better tomorrow. This has been Jackson Alpert for your Urban Nights update. Whitewashing is a serious issue, and hopefully sooner than later, Hollywood can give up on one of its oldest and ugliest habits. Dwayne The Rock Johnson has been named People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive. On top of this esteemed title, the former WWE champ turned actor has a highly anticipated movie being released this month called Moana. In an interview with People Magazine, he stated how excited he was and emphasized how much time it took for him to become comfortable in his own skin. So, what does Johnson think it is that fans find so sexy about him? He attributes it to his sense of humor and his cool, confident demeanor in his movies. His final piece of advice, take care of your face and exfoliate. Now for more on entertainment, let's join Natalie Morga. Hundreds of fake retail apps have popped out in Apple's App Store in recent weeks, just in time to deceive holiday shoppers. Some fake apps encourage users to log in using their Facebook credentials, potentially exposing sensitive personal information. Apple started the process of removing hundreds of fake apps, but it's important to keep an eye on the authenticity of the app. Long time ago, Instagram used to be only a place for photos with filters. Then, back in August, the app took a page out of the Snapchat's book with the introduction on Instagram stories. This allows users to post photos and videos with text, artwork, emojis, and just for 24 hours. Now Instagram is making moves to incorporate another major social media platform into their services. Yes, now Instagram is jumping on the live video bandwagon. The CEO has not revealed the new future release date, but we hope they do it before the end of the year. Cancel all your plans, grab the tissues, and put your eating pants on because the Netflix revival of Gilmore Girls is almost here. But the big release this weekend is the movie Bleed for This, starring Miles Teller. The inspirational story of world champion boxer Vinny Paciencia, who after a near fatal crash, which led him not knowing if he ever walk again, made one of the m sport's most incredible comebacks. Hey, you don't have to slug with this guy, all right? Do you know what's What? What is it? Yeah. Take care of the Cirque du Soleil? No, Cirque du Soleil. Cirque du Soleil. Oh, yeah. All right, come on. The kick is this! Cirque du Soleil is back in the San Francisco Bay Area. The massive white and gold top is in preparation for the U.S. premiere of its latest soul-touching production, Lucia. Lucia is an acrobatic waking dream of Mexico, which opens at AT&T Park in San Francisco on November for a limited engagement through January 29, 2017. The production will then move to Taylor Street Bridge in San Jose starting in February and continuing through March. 2017. For show information and tickets, visit cirquedesoleil.com slash Lucia. 
The blockbuster Broadway musical Hamilton is coming to the Ace HN Orphan Theater March 2017 as an anchor of the season. The show features music and lyrics by the Tony Award winner Lin Manuel Miranda. Hamilton is based on Ron Chernow's biography of the founding father Alexander Hamilton, a thoroughly inventive and widely entertaining musical about the birth of our nation, with a score that blends hip hop, pop, blues, and jazz. That is all for this edition. We will have more entertainment news for you next week. Thanks, Natalie. We're going to head over to our reporter, Laura Noel, who sat with Haley Steinfeld to talk surviving school and beyond as she prepares for her new film, The Edge of Seventeen, to premiere in theaters this Friday. Hey. Busy. I don't want to take up a ton of your time, but I'm going to kill myself. I just thought that an adult should know. Growing up can be tough, and high school junior Nadine struggles through this in the new coming-of-age comedy, The Edge of Seventeen. There are two types of people in the world. The people who radiate confidence and naturally excel at life. Golden boy. What's up? And the people who hope all those people die in a big explosion. I sat down with Academy Award nominee Haley Steinfeld and talked awkwardness, confidence, and her latest role as everyday American teenager Nadine. It was really different than everything I've done, but in ways equally as challenging. Uh, if not more. I have read contemporary pieces in the past and I've always felt slightly confused by them, but there was something so real and so honest about everything this character has to say uh, and everything she does um, that I was just so intrigued by and, and wanted to be a part of. Oh my God, I knew it. It's really just the hair. You can grow it out. Are you even up there? So you have had some, some experience where you can relate to Nadine and, and you've had moments where you felt a little, little awkward, maybe? Multiple, all the time, daily. And that's what this movie is. It's this character on this crazy journey of figuring out life itself. Do you have any advice for young people that might be feeling similar to Nadine, alone, awkward? Be who you are and do what makes you happy and um, stay confident. Yeah, it's sometimes easier said than done. Yeah, of course. When I was younger, so much younger than today. Your brother invited me to a party on Friday, and I want you to come with us. What did I do to make such a perfect kid, huh? And now these days have gone. I'm not so self-assured. Don't be awkward. Socialize. And don't miss The Edge of Seventeen. Please. Nick, I like you, and I just want to be with you. I want you to put your mouth on my We can do it in the Petland stock room. Nadine. God, you sound like a psychopath. I can't send this. No, 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 no. Oh my God, no! Oh, yeah. In San Francisco, for Academy of Art University's Urban Nights Update, I'm Laura Noel. That's all we have for this edition of Academy of Arts Urban Nights Update. I'm Mackenzie Granville. And I'm Jack Snalpert. From everyone here, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you back next time.